Welcome to Frog Talk, an Auction Frogs podcast series all about events and fundraising in a post-2020 world. For more information on Auction Frogs and the services we offer, visit auctionfrogs.org today. Hey, this is Corey Michaels. Welcome to another edition of Frog Talk, your leap into fundraising. And today I'm here with a dear friend and and one of the best auctioneers you're ever going to find, Larry Flynn. <laughs> How are you today? Uh, very kind. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. Love being here. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. And um, and I want to just clarify, I'm I'm uh, I'm not just I'm an, I'm a benefit auctioneer. Yes. So I want to make sure that people know a difference between a benefit auctioneer and then your traditional auctioneer. Well, and we're let's get into that in just a moment here because I think that is very important because there's a lot of people that specialize exactly in certain areas exactly. And so to have an actual benefit auctioneer that makes a huge difference. But let's let's start with you and what brought you to this part right now what is your why Uh what got you started (laughs) that's a great question too (laughs) as i look back it's not unlike your own story Uh, i'm sure Uh, yeah Um, i'm sure i i lived in ketchum in 1986 and um was on the radio up there for you know on a daily basis and Uh uh worked a morning show for years and um, was always the one that was asked to be the MC and or auctioneer for a fundraising event, uh, usually a mm-hmm. grassroots effort to raise money for someone that had been in an auto accident and didn't right. have insurance or their house burned and they needed immediate assistance or someone unfortunately diagnosed with cancer that either didn't have insurance or didn't have enough insurance. And um, that community at that time was very, very focused on on their you know residents we take care of the right. people there um and and so it all started with me never being able to say no to when i was asked <laughs> to be the mc or quote unquote auctioneer for yes for um for just a local grassroots fundraising effort to raise money for one of our loved ones that's basically how it started yeah and 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 that was I always say I started as a benefit auctioneer in 1990 because that's when I finally went to auctioneer college to more, not, not really learn how the auction business worked, but, but, but to give myself the credibility of calling myself an auctioneer, (laughs) um, and, and eventually being able to charge for the services that, that make a difference in the fundraising efforts of nonprofits. But it really did start at the grassroots level. There were very few major like fundraising galas back then. Yeah. And they have certainly um, exploded over the <laughs> last couple of decades. Some certainly yeah. um, I've seen growth in events for nonprofits grow over the last 30 plus years from those little grassroots fundraisers to million mm-hmm. dollar fundraisers for large organizations across the country. Um, one of the things I was uh, uh, lucky enough to do in my years as a morning show host in sun valley as i probably interviewed every celebrity that ever uh-huh. ever came to the valley and became, <laughs> and that was a lot <laughs> it, there were a lot and, and a lot of them became really great friends over the years as well and and even helped in some of these fundraising events that we did but yeah. it led me to to a man named christopher reeve who we know as mm-hmm. superman uh in more ways than one was he superman right. on stayed on uh on the screen, but he was also Superman in his plight for um, spinal cord research and mm-hmm. and recovery and finding a cure. And um, I worked for him all over the country at his fundraising events in Vail, Colorado. And the last one I did was his 50th birthday party in New York City in Times Square. And that was a whole lot of fun, especially when a guy like Robin Williams comes up and starts mocking me on stage. <laughs> for another $5,000, you can see his other hand move. Anyway, they, they were roommates at Juilliard and, and uh, uh, I I was gotten, getting off on a rabbit trail there, but but I, I, I did a lot of those big time celebrity events around the country. Those were the big galas of the time, right. you know, in the early 90s, mid 90s, before they became so big in our own communities like here in Boise. Um, in 2003, I, I decided to move my family from the Wood River Valley to Boise uh, because I was traveling so much and, and driving down to the airport mm-hmm. here in Boise and staying overnight. I said, I basically just said I could spend more time with the kids if we made the move to Boise. So we did. And it was the greatest move uh, that that we could have made. And at the time here in Boise, um, auctioneers really uh, were in small 
uh, the only the only auctioneers there were were those traditional auctioneers that really spent most of their time um, working events for people's um, personal properties or or estate cattle, sales, estate sales. And, yeah, the- um, and and uh, very talented uh, in in those areas, but but not real. Um, well versed in how nonprofits work and and mm-hmm. how they raise money and and what their protocols are when it comes to raising money for the critical missions that they have. Right, and and that's where I came in when I moved to the valley was to try and create some sort of a value for what it was I was doing in other parts of the country. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do it here in Boise, and so my roots in Boise started in two thousand three, and it started uh, with with a lot of the arts or organizations from the Boise Art Museum to opera to the Philharmonic and um, and ballet even uh, and and over time those events grew and and during that period of time the the credibility I had in the business grew and and was able to you know make it a profession eventually yeah. so that was kind of a long roundabout way to say how I got here today it started about 30 years ago when I thought I can make a living doing this but I'm not going to mm-hmm. charge a fee if I if I'm not making a difference and when I could when I could prove that I was making a difference it, it mm-hmm. really gave credibility to that well and, and at the time yeah. there might have been when I was working for Christopher Reeve there might have been six or eight benefit auctioneers around the country, um, yeah. which is probably one of the reasons I was so lucky to get involved. And then, right. uh, and then from there, uh, when I came here, there were none. Um, there were plenty of auctioneers, but none that just specialized in nonprofit fundraising. And that's, that's what all I've done for the last 30 years. Now, so this is a perfect time to circle back to what we talked about at the very <laughs> starting and the difference between a benefit auctioneer mm-hmm. at, like yourself that that's what you do that's right is you work with nonprofits you work with organizations to be able to grow their donor base to to grow their revenue for the great causes that they are doing as opposed to you know and of course we have to have these these folks that are great at what they do with bene, uh, with uh, with estate sales yep. and you know, farm sales and yep. livestock for exactly. FFA and for 4-H and all that. Two different things. So entirely different. Yeah. And, and, and both obviously require the ability to speak in front of an audience. Right. Um, the biggest difference is when we're speaking to an audience at a benefit event, people are eating and drinking and having a good time and they are there to support one of their favorite charities. Yeah. Um, we need to be well versed in the whole entire mission of the nonprofit that yeah. we're working for. We have to have a compassion for what it is they're trying to raise money for. Um, we, we have to know how they work from the inside out. I have, um, I, I feel I have, uh, really, focused a great amount of my attention on the needs mm-hmm. of the nonprofit and how we're going to achieve those needs for them uh, right. when it comes to the financial goals. Um, I'm a former development director for Make-A-Wish. So we had a $1.2 million budget and that money had to be raised somehow. And as yeah. a as a development director in a nonprofit, their job is to raise money. Uh, yep. Um, and then I was also a nonprofit for for a Sun Valley Ski Education Foundation, uh, a development director for them for a short time. Um, so I learned a lot about raising money for more advantaged athletes, right? And how to ra- and raising money the difference between that and raising money for for families that have tragic events in their lives and mm-hmm. how they affect them and. Um, that teaches me a great deal of, of, of why it's so important to have the compassion you need to have to do the job as the benefit auctioneer in a, in a traditional auctioneer's role. I wouldn't, I would not attempt to do what they do because Mm -hmm. I don't know how to clerk, um, 
a, a, an auction that's selling a thousand different items in a day. And they do. I mean, that's their profession. They, right. they That's their niche. Mm-hmm. My niche is in the nonprofit fundraising world. And uh, honestly, say 80 or 90 percent of what I do is in the planning meetings mm-hmm. in the days, weeks and months leading up oh, to the event. And oh, absolutely. by the way, I'm pretty good on stage, too. You know, <laughs> uh, so, oh, yeah. so if you are working together, you're you're, you're the, the, a big difference is that we, we really do work with the organization in the planning stages to make sure that when it does come time to sell those items as an auctioneer, that mm-hmm. they have worked so hard to procure, to get donated, um, is really is to to have the knowledge of what those items are inside and out and to be able to present them in a social situation. And here's a big thing. When you have a professional, uh, you know, nonprofit auctioneer, uh, you have someone like Larry that is going to help you with what's going to sell, what's not going to sell. That's right. Um, Because here's the thing. If you're doing a farm, a state, whatever sales, you have the lot that you have, Mm -hmm. and that's what you have to work with. And they're experts in that. When we're talking about nonprofits and galas and those things, there really is an order of things. There's a flow Mm -hmm. to the entire evening and items that work and don't work. And that's That's part of what you do is help those nonprofits to be able to go, yeah, that's the awesome. You might want to put that on silent auction, not live auction right. or, you know, oh, absolutely. There's um, I've always said there's a science to even the order of the sale yes. of the items in the mm-hmm. event, because there are, you may have two similar items at two different trips to Hawaii and one is more grand than the other. And so do you put those together back to back or do you separate them? Um, a lot of the thinking is you separate those, you know, do one earlier in the, in the live auction, do one later. But I have more and more started to put those kind of items back to back to where I'd put the better of the two Hawaii trips first so that mm-hmm. I'm, I've got the maximum amount of money from the person that wanted to buy that and right. bid high on it. And then everybody else that didn't win the bid on that one will bid on the next one. And we're already yep. on that subject. So why waste time and try and get their attention all over again and take right. them to Hawaii again? That's just a small example. I, I feel there's a real science to not only the order of the sale of the mm-hmm. items that are going to be in the live auction, um, but also to determine, like you said, what what what. What some may perceive would work really well in the live really won't. Furniture, artwork, jewelry, those are things that that um, require a, an advanced decision, even selling a puppy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I've been in a situation before where, where the high bidder of the puppy the next day realized, I shouldn't have bought that puppy. It's a 15-year commitment. Um, uh-huh. and I get my money back. Those are, yeah. those are things that you really, it makes it more difficult for the nonprofit, uh, to have to find another buyer for, for that. But, mm-hmm. but the, the things that are popular are things that are experiences, um, uh, especially now, especially yeah. now and, and local experiences. And we've got a lot of generous donors in this community that probably oh. get hit up every single day by the nif- different nonprofits that are coming. The other science to to n- not only the order of sale, but is where do you start the bidding? I, I think I'm different than just about any other auctioneer where I, I actually visualize that item, how it will sell in the room. And if it's one of those super popular items, I can start the bidding at a dollar and work it all the way up to wherever yep. it's going to go. But if it's an item, like I said, like, like jewelry or furniture or, or, um, th- things that don't have quite such the audience to bid uh-huh. on, I'm going to start that significantly higher because it might be the only bid we get on that. Item, right. <laughs> so the yeah. popularity of the item determines the starting price. And I have yeah. a different starting price for each and every item. It's not like I start them all at half the value. Well, and part of what you do is be able to read the room. Yep. And know what's yep. working, what's yep. not, what you think. Right. And all of that comes with experience. You can actually feel yeah. it. I had a uh-huh. uh, Zoom call earlier today with with our, our friend Mark Johnson. Uh-huh. And we were talking about that very same thing when we were talking about the upcoming Boise State auction on June 5th is that you feel when you walk into a room, you can kind of almost feel like it's going to be a great night. People are in a good yep. mood and they're in a giving mood. And you can almost feel mm-hmm. that. I've often adjusted the starting bids 
on items based on what the feel was in my mm-hmm. gut on, you know, I could raise them or lower them, but that, right. it's just one of those things I've got to have that instant flexibility to be able to do. And that is reading the room. Yep. And same thing as an MC, uh, you know, when I walk in a room, I can feel the energy. Mm-hmm. Good. Yep. <laughs> not so hey, oh, good yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we've all experienced all of those yeah and uh you know when you walk into a room and it's dead mm-hmm. and you feel there is just no energy it's like all right what's uh what's my plan now I, I, how yeah, can i convert <laughs> this room to get him ready yeah. for uh, like larry to be able to tee him up to get the most amount of money out of the room, they have to be engaged at that point. And that's another difference in hiring a professional benefit auctioneer versus a, 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 an an auctioneer that doesn't do benefits on a regular basis is that they, they do have the ability. We do have the ability to read the room, to feel the room, to determine the, in the timeline, what, Mm -hmm. what the, when do we start asking for money? And that is a critical time in the evening. If you start too late, you won't get their attention. If you start too early, you're, you're interrupting the social atmosphere that they want to have so there's a sweet spot there really is a sweet spot when it comes time for asking to give and and i really believe once you start asking you don't stop until it's done (laughs) Um, with many events although things are changing right now as you know um you know the newest forms of fundraising obviously we've done several together the the virtual virtual ones and they've been and, and they worked out great uh, it gave an avenue in this last year yeah. for for people to do their fundraising that wouldn't have been mm-hmm. able to otherwise. That's exactly right. And we've had some great ones together, Boy Scouts yeah. and others yeah. that uh, that turned out, you know, phenomenal. And they raised as much, sometimes mm-hmm. more. That's right. Than they had in the traditional gala. So That's now right. this year, uh, as we're in the post twenty twenty time. Mm-hmm. A lot of organizations are thinking, okay, well, now that we realize this larger footprint that we had uh, with a virtual event, being able to get out to donor base that doesn't live here, Mm -hmm. that doesn't live in the location, that never would have been able to buy a ticket and be there even though they are passionate about your cause. That's right. But now they can be a part of it. They can. They can. And and if they wanted to an attend event an event before because they wanted to support that organization this gives the organization another means of mm-hmm. uh, another avenue of fundraising if you will it's definitely here to stay i mean virtual may be new but it's here to stay i i do believe that that you know as a society we want to get back to the way things were we want to right. see our friends and go to these social events and and go to these fundraisers and i believe that giving will continue Yes, I believe that in ver- in person events have a high likelihood of also having a virtual aspect to it. Like mm-hmm. I might be looking at the audience live, but I also might be looking at a screen to see who's bidding from home, right? Because they're not ready to come back into that big social scene, or yeah. they're just not able to, or they just feel they want to give and they don't want to go through the whole night of being somewhere and right. they can do it from home, which is great. Um, there's so many newest, newer forms of fundraising now that nonprofits have had to, uh, explore Mm -hmm. from, from crowdsourcing and crowdfunding to all these new applications that can, that can, uh, be used for different nonprofits fundraising, um, opportunities. I, I believe that the hybrid event is probably going to be the most popular hybrid meaning, it's kind of the right. buzzword of events now. Yes, it, it is. It's both in person and virtual. And and like I said, I think giving will continue, but there will always be that virtual element. I do truly believe that people want to get back together. They want to keep going to events. I they, kinda also think as I as I think about what events will look like here in the coming months and years even that I think right off the st- off the top, I have I have a pretty decent fall lined up with in person events, mm-hmm. but not as busy as I would normally be. I'm actually almost fully booked next spring of 2022, 
and not so much. I think people are still trying to figure out, do we or don't we do live? Do we do hybrid? Because it's still right now so yeah. kind of, well, what's going to yeah. happen? Right yeah. now, things are looking better. Yeah. A great example is Friday, June 4th is St. Luke's Kid for a night. And mm-hmm. you know, usually that's 800 people at the center. And it's going to be 100% virtual again this year. The very yeah. next night is is an in-person event for Bronco Athletic Association with mm. with albeit there's usually 800 people at that event also but they're limiting it to 400 it's outside and it's on the bronco blue it's going to be a great you know great introduction event. getting yeah. back into the in person events but there will there's half the number of people mm-hmm. and um i, I kind of almost think and i might be cutting my throat by saying this but i think the average <laughs> age of a person attending the in person event may start to go down a little bit mm-hmm. because those of of a certain age, mine or more, uh, are are thinking. No, I don't want to attend the event, but I want to support that organization. Yes. So I'm going to participate in the virtual side of that event. And that's what we're always going to have. Exactly. Is yes, there are the people craving to it, be able yeah. to be yeah. in person exactly. and to be around other like minded people. Uh, sometimes I know for myself there is. Uh, there, there are certain events that I do every yeah. year that that's the only time I see those people mm-hmm. and right. I enjoy these people. It's not, you know, yeah. and you enjoy hanging out, talking, uh, conversing, talking about the cause, all of that. But there is going to be also a section of people younger and older mm-hmm. that are going to say, yeah, I still really believe in this cause mm-hmm. and I still really like y'all. I'm just not going to be hanging out with you in a, in a big place. Right. Not and yet anyway. Not yet. Yeah. And there's going to be a certain section that just isn't going right. to, they're not right. going to go to concerts. They're not going to go out and do those yeah. things. And that's they're, okay. They're they're Yeah. They're, we they're, don't want to leave them out. Exactly. And that's what I guess the virtual in a way has, has given that other opportunity. And like you said earlier, it's, it's a much wider a net to throw as Mm -hmm. well. You really, the sky's the limit as far as oh yeah, people that can attend virtually. Well, we've had virtual events where we have people in Europe and Canada and all around the world, let alone all around the country, right? That are not only participating, that are are getting the awareness of your cause, Mm -hmm. but are giving. Yeah, that's money that we never had before. And that's one of the and I've talked about this a lot in the series is one of the little silver linings that came out of 2020 was the virtual events and that reach that we never thought we needed. Exactly. And I I mean, I liken that too. I look at the last 30 plus years that I've been working with nonprofits raising money through their events. Mm -hmm. Um as I said earlier, started out in this grassroots fundraising for your local people. And it grew into something bigger and bigger and more important and um, cancer Mm -hmm. research and children's charities and animal charities and school, school fundraisers. Um, Those grew every year a little bit more, but none grew so fast as the virtual fundraising event. And, and it really did change how fundraising is done for nonprofits mm-hmm. all across the country, the world for, for that matter. But I have, I'm really, I'm a part of a group nationwide of benefit auctioneers. And we, we talk about what's working, what's not working, what's the best uh, practices for certain types of, of fundraising, whether it's virtual or in person. And, yeah. you know, we're always, we're always sharing with, with each other what's working and what's not working, right. what's here to stay, what's not. And, you know, there's no doubt about it. Virtual is here to stay. Nothing came on yeah. the scene as fast, but I do believe it's here to stay. Um, yeah. And then, like you said, though, people do want to get together um, and we'll get together mm-hmm. and we'll have fun again. Yep. It's in our nature. You know, it is. Um, We're social creatures. We are. We are. Yeah. It's just, it's a fact. All right, Larry, let's, let's talk about your company. So Larry Flynn benefit events. uh, I started um, a a little over 30 years ago when I, I saw an opportunity in, in, in what I thought was something I could do and make a living at it. Uh, When I was 30 years old, I had life-saving lung surgery. I was 
cut wide open. And I was living in L.A. at the time. I had moved from Sun Valley to go down and work on the Matlock TV show. Everything was going great. But then I got really, really sick. And I was in the hospital at the same time as um, Jim Henson, the Muppets creator. We both had the exact same ailment. And unfortunately, he didn't make it. Um, and and um, he was over at Cedar Sinai's. I was in Van Nuys. And anyway, I I I, I my whole feeling about what I wanted that I wanted to work in Hollywood uh, all changed. And I moved back up to Idaho, and uh, and continued doing my radio work. But I was continuing to be asked to do these fundraising events. And so I finally mm-hmm. went to school to call myself an auctioneer at auction school in Billings, Montana. I think I was the only one there without cowboy boots and the only one there with the <laughs> desire to only work with charities. And they all thought right. I was nuts, but I sure had a lot of fun anyway. Um, I totally respect what auctioneers that don't do benefits do. Like I said, I wouldn't attempt to do what they do. I love right. what they do. They're very entertaining. And and we are too on the benefit auction side, but, but we are there for the single purpose of raising as much money as we can for the organization. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, and I will give that credit to a, a traditional auctioneer as well. They're, they're, they're there to make as much money as they can for their client. It's the right. same thing, just yeah. a completely different style, mm-hmm. completely different style. I almost think we're just more MC entertainers and, and, and compassionate, um, um, uh, requesters of, of your credit limits <laughs> for the nonprofit, but, um, we have to be entertaining and we have to be, uh, able to keep the show moving, to keep mm-hmm. things moving, keep people engaged. And, and that's a big difference that I think we can make too. The more, the more you do a benefit event, the more you understand mm-hmm. how a crowd works and, and how you can have that control. A lot of organizations, right. well, we mm-hmm. have a very loud crowd. They're very social. How are you going to, how are you going to calm them down when it comes time? And we have really great methods of doing that yeah. and and they all work you know mm-hmm. um but uh uh we w- w- my, my company is all about like i said 80 percent of what what we do is 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 spend time with you in the days weeks months leading up to the event to make sure that we're going to launch a great event that's going to be super successful we want that event to be paid for with no expenses before the event occurs so we 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 encourage and 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 teach and consult on how to get sponsorships uh, for your event, so that mm-hmm. so that uh, the expenses are taken care of, and and that all the money made the night of the event goes directly to the nonprofit's mission, that's, which is what we goal. all want. Um, probably the yeah. biggest announcement I would make today is that um, uh, a, 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 through my because I've done this for so long. And because there was so few of us back then when I started, I've worked with so many along the way that have dreamed of becoming benefit auctioneers. And so Mm -hmm. I've taken um, several um, young men and women under my wing and and I want to share what I have learned over the years. Mm -hmm. And and I have certain ethical standards that and that I follow um, and rules of my own. When you work with a nonprofit, it's it's um, really important to keep, you know, the compass in the right direction. Right. one guy I worked with uh, over 10 years ago um, uh, at, at events I did in Southern California is a guy named Zach Crone. And Zach uh-huh. uh, was a bid spotter in the audience and a, just a great, great uh, personality, a really compassionate person, uh, very uh, want, wants to get involved with this nonprofit. See, he, was, he came from an acting background. Um, he, he, he's a very outgoing um, uh person and someone who has moved his young family to Idaho. Not a surprise, right? right? Nope. Um, rather than compete with each other, we thought it best that we, we combine our efforts. Yes. And so we have started Idaho Benefit Events, um, innovative fundraising for an innovative future. Um, Zach has probably done more uh, virtual events in anybody in the country. He d- he's the primary auctioneer for Julian's auctions. Just last weekend, he auctioned mm. all of Janet Jackson's wardrobe and and other accessories. Wow. Um, and uh, every week, it's something something new that uh, and exciting that he gets to do on on that side. But he has become a really really wonderful benefit auctioneer. And rather than competing with each other, we take the old guy and the young guy <laughs> and put them together. And there's a a whole lot of experience there that, that yes and, and we not only win um but the nonprofits win as well because they get both of us or one or the other uh for their events and um it kind of really uh gives the nonprofit the opportunity to be able to to not just have one consultant on the fundraising event mm-hmm. side but two um and we're really excited um we've already uh made some great strides toward um 
um, uh, working with with nonprofits that haven't had yeah. the ability or thought they didn't have the ability to 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 hire someone like us. Right. Well, and I very much, uh, you know, I, I'm very excited to get to work with Zach. I've had him on here on frog talk to talk to him and it was, uh, you know, and and I, I got to meet him at one of our events, uh, the the red shoe shindig. Yes. The red shoe shindig. (laughs) And, you know, I really think the world of him, you can mm-hmm. tell his heart, yep. you can tell his passion. Yep. And we haven't done an event together, but I'm really excited to do one with him uh, and for us yep. as well yep. to continue and to keep doing more and to be able to raise more money and to make as much of a difference for causes as we can. That's exactly And that's right. where all of our hearts are. All of the information for Larry uh, and for Zach will be in the description here of the podcast. So you can find out how to be able to get a hold of them, how they can be able to help you with your next event. Oh, thank you. And then, of course, all of our information on there as well. And Larry, my friend, it's always an honor to get to uh, hang out. The honor is mine. Thank you, Corey. I really appreciate being asked. And uh, it would be really fun to have Zach and I here together sometime. Yes. If you want to, you know, definitely take a break from the mic, I'm sure we'll just keep it. <laughs> there, I'm going to take you up on that, Larry. So we will have that coming up for an episode here of Frog Talk with both Larry and Zach. Excellent. Thanks so much, Corey. Really do appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, and really, Frog Talk is such a great tool for nonprofits to listen to and get some ideas from. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we will chat again on the next episode of Frog Talk, your leap into fundraising. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Frog Talk, an Auction Frogs podcast series all about events and fundraising in a post-2020 world. For more information on Auction Frogs and the services we offer, visit auctionfrogs.org today. 